My Life and Work by Henry Ford Chapter 2 What I Learned About Business This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Robert Robinson my gasoline buggy was the first and for a long time the only automobile in detroit it was considered to be something of a nuisance for it made a racket and it scared horses it also blocked traffic for if i stopped my machine anywhere in town a crowd was around it before i could start up again if i left it alone even for a minute some inquisitive person always tried to run it finally i had to carry a chain and chain it to a lamp post wherever i left it anywhere and then there was trouble with the police. I do not know quite why, for my impression is that there were no speed limit laws in those days. Anyway, I had to get a special permit from the mayor, and thus, for a time, enjoyed the distinction of being the only licensed chauffeur in America. I ran that machine about 1,000 miles through 1895 and 1896, and then sold it to Charles Ainsley of Detroit for $200. That was my first sale. I had built the car not to sell, but only to experiment with. I wanted to start another car. Ainsley wanted to buy, I could use the money, and we had no trouble in agreeing upon a price. It was not at all my idea to make cars in any such petty fashion. I was looking ahead to production, but before that could come I had to have something to produce. It does not pay to hurry. I started a second car in 1896. It was much like the first, but a little lighter. It also had the belt drive, which I did not give up until some time later, the belts were all right, excepting in hot weather. That is why I later adopted gears. I learned a great deal from that car. Others in this country and abroad were building cars by that time, and in 1895 I heard that a Benz car from Germany was on exhibition in Macy's store in New York. I traveled down to look at it, but it had no features that seemed worthwhile. It also had the belt drive, but it was much heavier than my car. I was working for lightness, the foreign makers have never seemed to appreciate what lightweight means. I built three cars at all in my home shop, and all of them ran for years in Detroit. I still have the first car. I bought it back a few years later from a man to whom Mr. Ainsley had sold it. I paid $100 for it. During all this time, I kept my position with the electric company and gradually advanced to chief engineer at a salary of $125 a month. But... My gas engine experiments were no more popular with the president of the company than my first mechanical learnings were with my father. It was not that my employer objected to experiments, only to experiments with a gas engine. I can still hear him say, Electricity, yes, that's the coming thing, but gas, no. He had ample grounds for his skepticism, to use the mildest terms. Practically no one had the remotest notion of the future of the internal combustion engine, while we were just on the edge of the great electrical development. As with every comparatively new idea, electricity was expected to do much more than we even now have any indication that it can do. I did not see the use of experimenting with electricity for my purposes. A road car could not run on a trolley even if trolley wires had been less expensive. No storage battery was in sight of a weight that was practical. An electrical car had of necessity to be limited in radius and to contain a large amount of motive machinery in proportion to the power exerted. That is not to say that I held or now hold electricity cheaply. We have not yet begun to use electricity. But it has its place, and the internal combustion engine has its place. Neither can substitute for the other, which is exceedingly fortunate. I have the dynamo that I first had charge of at the Detroit Edison Company. When I started our Canadian plant, I bought it from an office building to which it had been sold by the electric company. Had it revamped a little, and for several years it gave excellent service in the Canadian plant. When we had to build a new power plant owing to increases in business, I had the old motor taken out to my museum, a room out at Dearborn that holds a great number of my mechanical treasures. The Edison Company offered me the general superintendency of the company, but only on condition that I would give up my gas engine and devote myself to something really useful. I had to choose between my job and my automobile. I chose the automobile, or rather I gave up the job. There really was nothing in the way of a choice, for I already knew that the car was bound to be a success. I quit my job on August 15th, 1899, and went into the automobile business. 
It might be thought of something of a step, for I had no personal funds. What money was left over from living was all used in experimenting, but my wife agreed that the automobile could not be given up, and that we had to make or break. There was no, quote, demand, unquote, for automobiles. There never is for a new article. They were accepted in much the fashion, as was more recently the airplane. At first, the so-called horseless carriage was considered merely a freak notion, and many wise people explained with particularity why it could never become more than a toy. No man of money even thought of it as a commercial possibility. I cannot imagine why each new means of transportation meets with such opposition. There are even those today who shake their heads and talk about the luxury of the automobile and only grudgingly admit that perhaps the motor truck is of some use. But, in the beginning, there was hardly anyone who sensed that the automobile could be a large factor in industry. The most optimistic hoped only for a development akin to that of the bicycle. When it was found that an automobile really could go, and several makers started to put out cars, the immediate query was as to which would go fastest. It was a curious but natural development, that racing idea. I never thought anything of racing, but the public refused to consider the automobile in any light other than as a fast toy. Therefore, later, we had to race. The industry was held back by this initial racing slant, for the attention of the makers was diverted to making fast, rather than good, cars. It was a business for speculators. A group of men of speculative turn of mind organized, as soon as I left the electric company, the Detroit Automobile Company to exploit my car. I was the chief engineer and held a small amount of the stock. For three years, we continued making cars more or less on the model of my first car. We sold very few of them. I could get no support at all toward making better cars to be sold to the public at large. The whole thought was to make to order and to get the largest price possible for each car. The main idea seemed to be to get the money. And, being without authority other than my engineering position gave me, I found that the new company was not a vehicle for realizing my ideas, but merely a money-making concern. That did not make much money. In March 1902, I resigned, determined never again to put myself under orders. The Detroit Automobile Company later became the Cadillac Company, under the ownership of the Lelands, who came in subsequently. I rented a shop, a one-story brick shed, at 81 Park Place to continue my experiments and to find out what business really was. I thought that it must be something different from what it had proved to be in my first adventure. In the year from 1902 until the formation of the Ford Motor Company was practically one of investigation. In my little one-room brick shop, I worked on the development of a four-cylinder motor, and on the outside, I tried to find out what business really was and whether it needed to be quite so selfish a scramble for money as it seemed to be from my first short experience. From the period of the first car, which I have described, until the formation of my present company, I built in all about 25 cars, of which 19 or 20 were built with the Detroit Automobile Company. The automobile had passed from the initial stage, where the fact that it could run at all was enough, to the stage where it had to show speed. Alexander Winton of Cleveland, the founder of the Winton car, was then the track champion of the country and willing to meet all comers. I designed a two-cylinder enclosed engine of a more compact type than I'd used before, fitted it into a skeleton chassis, found that I could make speed, and arranged a race with Winton. We met on the Gross Point track at Detroit. I beat him. That was my first race, and it brought advertising of the only kind that people cared to read. The public thought nothing of a car unless it made speed, unless it beat other racing cars. My ambition, to build the fastest car in the world, led me to plan a four-cylinder motor. But more of that later. The most surprising feature of business as it was conducted was the large attention given to finance and the small attention to service. That seemed to me to be reversing the natural process, which is that the money should come as the result of work and not before the work. The second feature was the great indifference to better methods of manufacture as long as whatever was done got by and took the money. In other words, an article apparently was not built with reference to how greatly it could serve the public, but with reference solely to how much money could be had for it, and that without any particular care whether the customer was satisfied. To sell him was enough. 
a dissatisfied customer was regarded not as a man whose trust had been violated, but either as a nuisance or as a possible source of more money in fixing up the work which ought to have been done correctly in the first place. For instance, in automobiles there was not much concern as to what happened to the car once it had been sold. How much gasoline it used per mile was of no great moment, how much service it actually gave did not matter, and if it broke down and had to have parts replaced, then that was just hard luck for the owner. It was considered good business to sell parts at the highest possible price on the theory that, since the man had already bought the car, he simply had to have the part and would be willing to pay for it. The automobile business was not on what I would call an honest basis, to say nothing of being, from a manufacturing standpoint, on a scientific basis, but it was no worse than business in general. That was the period, it may be remembered, in which many corporations were being floated and financed. The bankers, who before then had confined themselves to the railroads, got into industry. My idea was then, and still is, that if a man did his work well, the price he would get for that work, the profits, and all financial matters, would care for themselves, and that a business ought to start small and build itself up and out of its earnings. If there are no earnings, then that's a signal to the owner that he is wasting his time and does not belong in that business. I have never found it necessary to change those ideas, but I discovered that this simple formula of doing good work and getting paid for it was supposed to be slow for modern business. The plan at that time most in favor was to start off with the largest possible capitalization and then sell all the stock and all the bonds that could be sold. Whatever money happened to be left over, after all the stock and bond selling expenses and promoters, charges and all that, went grudgingly into the foundation of the business. A good business was not one that did good work and earned a fair profit. A good business was one that would give the opportunity for the floating of a large amount of stocks and bonds at high prices. It was the stocks and bonds, not the work, that mattered. I could not see how a new business or an old business could be expected to be able to charge into its product a great big bond interest and then sell the product at a fair price. I have never been able to see that. I have never been able to understand on what theory the original investment of money can be charged against a business. Those men in business who call themselves financiers say that money is quote unquote worth 6% or 5% or some other percent and that if business has $100,000 invested in it, the man who made the investment is entitled to charge an interest payment on the money, because if, instead of putting that money into the business, he had put it into a savings bank or into certain securities, he could have a certain fixed return. Therefore, they say that a proper charge against the operating expenses of a business is the interest on this money. This idea is at the root of many business failures and most service failures. Money is not worth a particular amount. As money, it's not worth anything, for it will do nothing of itself. The only use of money is to buy tools to work with or the product of those tools. Therefore, money is worth what it will help you to produce or buy and no more. If a man thinks that his money will earn 5% or 6%, he ought to place it where he can get that return. But money placed in a business is not a charge on the business, or rather should not be. It ceases to be money and becomes, or, or should become, an engine of production, and it is therefore worth what it produces, and not a fixed sum according to some scale which has no bearing on the particular business in which the money has been placed. Any return should come after it has produced, not before. Businessmen believe that you could do anything by financing it. If it did not go through on the first financing, then the idea was to refinance. The process of refinancing was simply the game of sending good money after bad. In the majority of cases, the need of refinancing arises from bad management, and the effect of refinancing is simply to pay the poor managers to keep up their bad management a little longer. It is merely a postponement of the day of judgment. This makeshift of refinancing is a device of speculative financiers. Their money is no good to them unless they can connect it up with a place where real work is being done. And that they cannot do unless, somehow, that place is poorly managed. Thus, the speculative financiers delude themselves that they are putting their money out to use. They are not. They are putting it out to waste. I determined absolutely that never would I join a company 
in which finance came before the work or in which bankers or financiers had a part. And, further that, if there were no great way to get started in the kind of business that I thought could be managed in the interest of the public, then I simply would not get started at all. For my own short experience, together with what I saw going on around me, was quite enough proof that business as a mere money-making game was not worth giving much thought to, and was distinctly no place for a man who wanted to accomplish anything. Also, it did not seem to me to be the way to make money. I have yet to have it demonstrated that it is the way, for the only foundation of real business is service. A manufacturer is not through with his customer when a sale is completed. He has only then started with his customer. In the case of an automobile, the sale of the machine is only something in the nature of an introduction. If the machine does not give service, then it is better for the manufacturer if he never had the introduction, for he will have the worst of all advertisements, a dissatisfied customer. There was something more than a tendency in the early days of the automobile to regard the selling of a machine as the real accomplishment, and that thereafter it did not matter what happened to the buyer. That is the short-sighted salesman on commission attitude. If a salesman is paid only for what he sells, it is not to be expected that he is going to exert any great effort on a customer out of whom no more commission is to be made. And it is right on this point that we later made the largest selling argument for the Ford. The price and quality of the car would undoubtedly have made a market, and a large market. We went beyond that. A man who bought one of our cars was, in my opinion, entitled to continuous use of that car, and therefore, if he had a breakdown of any kind, it was our duty to see that his machine was put into shape again at the earliest possible moment. In the success of the Ford car, the early provision of service was an outstanding element. Most of the expensive cars of that period were ill-provided with service stations. If your car broke down, you had to depend on the local repairman, when you were entitled to depend on the manufacturer. If the local repairman were a forehanded sort of person, keeping on hand a good stock of parts, although on many of the cars the parts were not interchangeable, the owner was lucky. But if the repairman were a shiftless person, with an adequate knowledge of automobiles and an inordinate desire to make a good thing out of every car that came into his place for repairs, then even a slight breakdown meant weeks of laying up and a whopping big repair bill that had to be paid before the car could be taken away. The repairmen were, for a time, the largest menace to the automobile industry. Even as late as 1910 and 1911, the owner of an automobile was regarded as essentially a rich man whose money ought to be taken away from him. We met that situation squarely and at the very beginning. We would not have our distribution blocked by stupid, greedy men. That is getting some years ahead of the story. But it is control by finance that breaks up service because it looks to the immediate dollar. If the first consideration is to earn a certain amount of money, then, unless by some stroke of luck matters are going especially well, and there is a surplus over for service so that the operating men may have a chance, future business has to be sacrificed for the dollar of today. And also I noticed a tendency among many men in business to feel that their lot was hard. They worked against a day when they might retire and live on an income, get out of the strife. Life to them was a battle to be ended as soon as possible. That was another point I could not understand, for, as I reasoned, life is not a battle except with our own tendency to sag with the downpool of, quote, getting settled, unquote. If to petrify is success, all one has to do is to humor the lazy side of the mind. But if grow is success, then one must wake up anew every morning and keep awake all day. I saw great businesses become but the ghost of a name because someone thought they could be managed just as they were always managed. And though the management may have been most excellent in its day, its excellence consisted in its alertness to its day, and not in slavish following of its yesterdays. Life, as I see it, is not a location, but a journey. Even the man who most feels himself settled is not settled. He is probably sagging back. Everything is in flux and was meant to be. Life flows. We may live at the same number of the street, but it is never the same man who lives there. And, out of the delusion that life is a battle that may be lost by a false move, grows, I have noticed, a great love for regularity. Men fall into the half-alive habit. Seldom does the cobbler take up with the newfangled way of soling shoes, 
and seldom does the artisan willingly take up with new methods in his trade. Habit conduces to a certain inertia, and any disturbance of it affects the mind like trouble. It will be recalled that when a study was made of shop methods, so that the workmen might be taught to produce with less useless motion and fatigue, I was the most opposed by the workmen themselves. Though they suspected that it was simply a game to get more out of them, what most irked them was that it interfered with the well-worn grooves in which they had become accustomed to move. Businessmen go down with their businesses because they like the old way so well they cannot bring themselves to change. One sees them all about, men who do not know that yesterday is past and who woke up this morning with their last year's ideas. It could almost be written down as a formula that when a man begins to think that he has at last found his method, he had better begin a most searching examination of himself to see whether some part of his brain has not gone to sleep. There is a subtle danger in a man thinking that he is fixed for life. It indicates that the next jolt of the wheel of progress is going to fling him off. There is also a great fear of being thought a fool. So, many men are afraid of being considered fools. I grant that public opinion is a powerful police influence for those who need it. Perhaps it's true that the majority of men need the restraint of public opinion. Public opinion may keep a man better than he would otherwise be, if not better morally, at least better as far as his social desirability is concerned. But it is not a bad thing to be a fool for righteousness' sake. The best of it is that such fools usually live long enough to prove that they were not fools, or the work they have begun lives long enough to prove they were not foolish. The money influence, the pressing to make profit on an investment, and its consequent neglect of or skimping of work and hence of service, showed itself to me in many ways. It seemed to be at the bottom of most troubles. It was the cause of low wages, for without well-directed work high wages cannot be paid. And if the whole attention is not given to the work, it cannot be well directed. Most men want to be free to work. Under the system in use, they could not be free to work. During my first experience, I was not free. I could not give full play to my ideas. Everything had to be planned to make money. The last consideration was the work. And the most curious part of it all was the insistence that it was the money and not the work that counted. It did not seem to strike anyone as illogical that money should be put ahead of work, even though everyone had to admit that the profit had to come from the work. The desire seemed to be to find a shortcut to money and pass over the obvious shortcut, which is through the work. Take competition. I found that competition was supposed to be a menace and that a good manager circumvented his competitors by getting a monopoly through artificial means. The idea was that there were only a certain number of people who could buy and that it was necessary to get their trade ahead of someone else. Some will remember that later many of the automobile manufacturers entered into an association under the Selden patent just so that it might be legally possible to control the price and the output of automobiles. They had the same idea that so many trade unions have, the ridiculous notion that more profit can be had doing less work than more. The plan, I believe, is a very antiquated one. I could not see then, and am still unable to see, that there is not always enough for the man who does his work. Time spent in fighting competition is wasted. It had better be spent in doing the work. There are always enough people ready and anxious to buy, provided you supply what they want and at the proper price, and this applies to personal services as well as to goods. During this time of reflection, I was far from idle. We were going ahead with a four-cylinder motor and the building of a pair of big racing cars. I had plenty of time, for I never left my business. I do not believe a man can ever leave his business. He ought to think of it by day and dream of it by night. It is nice to plan to do one's work in office hours, to take up the work in the morning and to drop it in the evening, and not have a care until the next morning. It is perfectly possible to do that, if one is so constituted as to be willing through all of his life to accept direction and to be an employee possibly a responsible employee, but not a director or a manager of anything. A manual laborer must have a limit on his hours, otherwise he will wear himself out. If he intends to remain always a manual laborer, then he should forget about his work when the whistle blows. But, if he intends to go forward and do anything, 
The whistle is only a signal to start thinking over the day's work in order to discover how it might be done better. The man who has the largest capacity for work and thought is the man who is bound to succeed. I cannot pretend to say, because I do not know, whether the man who works always, who never leaves his business, who is absolutely intent upon getting ahead, and who therefore does get ahead, is happier than the man who keeps office hours, both for his brain and his hands. It is not necessary for anyone to decide the question. A ten-horsepower engine will not pull as much as a twenty. The man who keeps brain office hours limits his horsepower. If he is satisfied only to pull the load that he has, well and good, that is his affair. But he must not complain if another who has increased his horsepower pulls more than he does. Leisure and work bring different results. If a man wants leisure and gets it, then he has no cause to complain, but he cannot have both leisure and the results of work. Concretely, what I most realized about business in that year, and I have been learning more each year without finding it necessary to change my first conclusions, is this. Number one that finance is given a place ahead of work and therefore tends to kill the work and destroy the fundamental of service. Number two, that thinking first of money instead of work brings on fear of failure and this fear blocks every avenue of business. It makes a man afraid of the competition, of changing his methods, or of doing anything which might change his condition. And three, that the way is clear for anyone who thinks first of service, of doing the work in the best possible way. End of chapter 2. This recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Robinson. Winter Butterflies in Bolinas by Mary D. Barber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Monarch Butterfly, Anosia plexippus, is a familiar object in many parts of the United States. But the fact that it migrates covering in its flights hundreds and even thousands of miles is not generally known this butterfly appears in immense swarms every year early in september at bolinas a sheltered haven on the coast of california about ten miles north of the golden gate a southerly beach walled by high bluffs a quaint little village which consists of trim cottages set in pretty old-fashioned gardens wide stretches of sunny mesa broken here and there by arroyos and groves of cypress trees make up a picturesque landscape while to the south and westward rolls the vast pacific the ceaseless surging of its surf on the smooth sand a never-ending delight to the ear this is the winter home of the monarch butterfly which comes not only from the sierra nevada mountains but also from the western ranges of the rockies on the meadows of these mountains a pale green caterpillar ornamented with glossy black bands feeds on the leaves of the milkweed plant this caterpillar forms a chrysalis about an inch long green spotted with gold the monarch butterfly emerges from this chrysalis, unfurls its wings, draws its sustenance from the milkweed blossoms, lays its eggs, and lives happily in the high altitudes till the chill of approaching autumn in the air warns it that the time for migrating has come. Thousands of these frail butterflies start on their long journey toward the Pacific in search of a mild climate free from frost and snow in which they can live all winter fly brown butterflies out to sea frail pale wings for the winds to try small brown wings that we scarce can see fly here and there may a chance caught eye note in a score of you twain or three brighter or darker of tinge or dye 
some fly light as a laugh of glee some fly soft as a long low sigh all to the heaven where each would be fly in nevada county great flocks of them have been seen following the course of a stream downwards from the mountains toward the sea before they reach the end of their journey they scatter for although they appear in bolinas suddenly and in large numbers no flock has ever been seen approaching in mass the monarch is of a reddish chestnut brown veined with black and bordered with a band of black which is ornamented by two rows of small white spots the underside of the wings is paler an ashy buff color similarly veined and bordered the butterfly is large measuring between four and five inches from tip to tip of outstretched wings when these butterflies arrive the air seems full of them hovering flitting whirling like brown autumn leaves caught in a gust of wind having reached their winter home they swarm on a cypress tree which affords the best shelter during wind and storm each year they come not only to the same grove but to the very same tree and always to the southerly and easterly side of it this tree is within sight and sound of the surf which perhaps reminds the butterflies of the roar of rushing streams and waterfalls in the mountains whence they came is it instinct or scent or the climatic advantage of some especial tree which guides them in their choice it is certainly a mystery that a newly arrived flock should choose the identical tree which was the home of their predecessors the winter before for they migrate but to end their days and cannot return to show the way to their progeny which will hatch next spring into stupid caterpillars having no desire but to eat till their time for sleep arrives the instinct or intelligence of the awakened butterfly is inexplicable on sunny days the monarchs feast on the flowers that bloom all winter in the village gardens calla lilies marguerites and heliotrope being their favorites one day a bee and a butterfly were vying with each other for the possession of a marguerite the butterfly alighted on it first but the bee buzzed his way in under the wings of his rival who realizing that his companion was dangerous flew off leaving the bee sole possessor of the coveted flower at evening the monarchs return to the grove where they may be seen hanging on the cypress branches a tree appears brown as if covered with dead leaves as the butterflies in countless thousands hang close together with folded wings to conserve the warmth of their frail bodies in stormy weather they remain thus dormant for days and even weeks benumbed by the cold yet clinging fast to the branches many however are wrenched from their places of refuge and lie scattered on the ground like a carpet of fallen leaves one evening a number of these which had hardly a spark of life remaining in their water-soaked bodies as they lay on the grass were picked up and brought into the house where a fire of driftwood blazed bright on the hearth the butterflies soon revived in the warm atmosphere hung themselves to the curtains in lieu of trees and went to sleep for the night next morning dawned bright and clear the captive monarchs awakened early and flew away happy when the window was opened to release them the many birds that choose bolinas as their winter home would have a feast if these butterflies were edible but monarchs are protected by an acrid secretion which is distasteful to birds and enjoy a long life on this account living not only all winter but long enough to taste the sweetness of the spring wild flowers the monarchs are great migrants they have crossed the pacific ocean 
probably on ships and have reached the philippine islands and australia when on a yacht bound for the farallone islands members of the party saw one of these butterflies soaring over the ocean about ten miles from shore it did not rest on the boat but with wings spread before the east wind it sped away following the path of the setting sun like a soul in quest of the ideal that evening a storm came on suddenly what was the fate of that lone butterfly he died unlike his mates i ween perhaps not sooner or worse crossed and he had felt thought known and seen a larger life and hope though lost far out at sea this is the tale of the winter butterflies in bolinas as told by mary d barber and put into permanent form by paul elder and company under the direction of ricardo j orozco during the month of january of the year nineteen eighteen with decorations by rudolph f shabafer end of winter butterflies in bolinas by mary d barber read for librivox by sue anderson